Okay, we're and for questions, uh, since this is being recorded, I'll bring you a microphone, and the and the speakers will have a microphone. Uh, so it'll everybody will be able to hear everything. So Dr. Huber, are you ready? I think you're first. Is that? I gotta look. Yes, yes, your list is first, so you're back up again. <laughs> um, you can use how that mic, we, or do you want to use this? How, how do we how do we get up on the oh. screen? You're up. Okay. It, and you know how to use this? No. Do you want to use the handheld speaker or this one? Why don't I use this one? Uh, <laughs> okay. Although it's a little harder for me to stay in one, one spot all the time. At my age, I have to move once in a while so you can tell the difference between rigor mortis and arthritis. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll try it here. But mentioned uh, the new genetic, the new proteins and products that are produced when you alter the genetic code. And you can look at all of the commercial products that we've had genetically engineered products, and you can see every one of them has a toxicity. Many of them are chronic, may take 20 or 30 years. It's kind of like tobacco. Doesn't just happen overnight. It's not an acute toxicity with the exception of the L-tryptophan, which I mentioned where we had 80 people that died in a matter of one week after the release of that product, and 10,000 then are now that are permanently incapacitated. But you can go down the whole list and you can see all of the toxic entities. So when the EPA says, well, we don't need to test anything because if it has roots and leaves and stem, it's substantially equivalent to what we had before and therefore we don't need to test it. All of those that have been tested, we've shown severe problems with including our GM corn, soybean, canola, cotton, and alfalfa. Uh, Shiva Aradari and his group at MIT have shown that when you disrupt the integrity of the genetic code, you block C1 metabolism. So you have, glyph or have uh, formaldehyde that's present in our GMO corn and soybean. We have anywhere from 10 to 200 parts per million formaldehyde in it. Probably why the animals can tell the difference and select it. We're not quite that sensitive for it. So if you're going to eat GMOs all the time, all your life, when you go to the undertaker, ask for a discount. You're already half pickled. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a critical need for that safety testing. And every one of them that we've seen have a problem. <coughs> We had an interesting situation this last summer. We had 46 million turkeys and chickens that died from bird flu. Not a single uh, poultry that was under organic feed or that was free range contracted the disease. My, my USDA colleagues say it's really a strange uh, strain of the flu. What happened, and what we can speculate is happening, is that on the GMO food, you have not just the genetics for the trait, but you have the CAM35S promoter gene, which is the virulence genes for viruses. They may use two or three others. <coughs> the primary one, though, The primary promoter is the CAM35. Well, that's what makes the virus virulent. <laughs> that gene we know can be picked up by your intestinal microorganisms during digestion. And it then can also be picked up by us. If you have a weak virus that comes along that might normally just be uh, disposed of through your immune system, 
with the CAM35, that weak virus can then become very virulent. <coughs> so that it becomes a very serious problem because we <coughs> compromised our immune system. <coughs> the products, the glyphosate, the herbicides that we're using are also very strong mineral chelators, as I indicated this morning with the glyphosate. Those uh, minerals are the keys for enzyme function. So if you want to shut down an enzyme, you merely pull the key out of the ignition, as I've put up here as an example with a motor sitting out there in a tractor or a car. Doesn't do any work for you until you turn the key on. It's the cofactor that's the key. Those are the minerals, and especially the micronutrients. If they're chelated, they can't function in that capacity. <coughs> and so our foods now that are very deficient in our micronutrients especially are empty calories. We don't have the keys to keep a lot of those physiological functions for our immunity still functional. It shuts it down. It compromises it. We have the antibiotic activity of many of our micro or many of our pesticides also. Glyphosate systemic, it moves through the plant. You can just squirt it on. It's what made it such a great herbicide. You didn't have to have good coverage because it distributes itself, <clears throat> but it accumulates in the growth points, in the shoot tips, root tips, and in the reproductive structures so that we end up with a concentration and a bioaccumulation of those products then, so that we not only have the antibiotic coming into our body regularly, but it's also then in the environment. As the glyphosate moves down into the root system, it shuts down the plant's defense system so that it becomes very susceptible to the soil-borne diseases and then as it moves out into the soil, it's very toxic to all of your beneficial organisms, your nitrogen fixers, your mycorrhizae, your biological control organisms, your earthworms and your plant growth promoters that David uh, showed us earlier uh, in his talk are so important. And they're also, it, those organisms in our GI tract <coughs> are very susceptible to glyphosate, Lac the lactobacillus, your bifidobacteria, and those hundreds of other organisms are all taken out of your GI tract so that we can't digest a lot of the foods and we end up with gluten intolerance, not an intolerance to many of the other uh, products that would normally be digested are now uh, acting as allergens for us because the organisms aren't there to do that. We see that there are many food and feed safety concerns, both from the chemicals as well as from the genetic engineering process and those new products that are produced that we've never seen before in nature. You see a total in, uh, ecological disruption. You see the gene flow from the product, the engineered product, to our own organisms. <coughs> and so you have a total change in your gut microflora. That's our eighth organ when you look at the GI tract. And you have a change in the ecology of that that has very dramatic effects because your beneficial organisms are all taken out with the antibiotics and your pathogens are all increased to fill that void. Consequence <coughs> of that is, is the uh, uh, average loss now in our large dairies is six cows a month that die from chronic botulism. In humans, we call that Chronic fatigue syndrome, or in infants, we call it sudden infant death. It's because we have a disrupted ecology. 
We stimulate the, the Clostridium, perfringens, and botulinum, and other species there. We get all of those very potent neurotoxins that bring a, about uh, death for us. You can see this in the cows from Dr. Monica Kruger's research. Again, about six cows per month are dying in many of our dairies. Veterinarians have a hard time identifying it because they've never anticipated it. I showed this with the pigs and that uh, allergenic effect of of the GMO proteins on the stomach lining, the inflammation, the ulceration, the leaky gut that comes about, the intestines are, <coughs> are deteriorating, the lining's deteriorating. We no longer have the integrity of that single cell lining that protects us from the toxicities in that area. And that, that thin wall that's one cell thick, as George indicated, or David indicated, that stands between us and the microbes and disaster, as we're seeing in our population. My wife and I visited my son-in-law last Christmas. His mother was visiting, said that she'd just gone through a real severe epidemic in their nursing facility or their retirement facility of Difficile diarrhea, said six of them failed to respond to any of the antibiotics. And uh, <coughs> the doctor suggested a fecal transplant as a last resort. Five of them said, doesn't sound very good to me, and rejected it. She's the only one that survived. It's life and death when you remove that thin single layer in that area, we've changed the system. You see how many gastrointestinal problems we have in our society. Glyphosate is a very powerful antibiotic against those beneficial organisms. You see that entire area now <clears throat> becoming a serious problem in our animals, our people, and animals in the environment so that the, this is a disease that didn't even exist before GMOs. These are new diseases. These are new problems. We commonly refer to them as etiology unknown because we don't want to connect the dots. The dots have been connected, but they don't want to accept them because it goes back to the GMO and the glyphosate that's so commonly used. Now, when you see it on in layers, these, uh, the duodenal necrosis, again, this didn't exist as a disease before. We didn't recognize it as a, a disease. You see all of the problems. You see the bees, the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. The bee has to have in the honey crop to digest those foods. The honey and the bee bread, the protein, and that are extremely sensitive to glyphosate. And so where do we, what do we do around our hives? Our, our beekeepers want to make sure that the honey is either alfalfa honey or canola honey or, or whatnot, and so they spray around the hives <coughs> excuse me, to make sure that there isn't any contaminating weeds to contaminate the, the flavor of the honey. Well, you kill off the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, the bees are dying because they don't have the nutrients in the uh, nectar that they're collecting from the GMO crops because the glyphosate and that are such strong uh, chelators for the micronutrients. The plants are deficient. And then you have that loss, the antibiotic effect with the glyphosate that's picked up by the bees when they're foraging. And as I mentioned, you also have then the endocrine hormone disruption that you combine that with the neonic endocrine hormone disruption. So you have bees that are micronutrient deficient. You have them starving because you've changed the gut microbiome or the honey crops microbiome. And then you have an endocrine hormone disruptor that uh, destroys their ability to navigate 
and to continue. And so you see an example here where they put the hives, put it right in front of the GMO canola that's going to be sprayed with, with the uh, glyphosate. They've already sprayed out the uh, grass and the weeds along the fence row with, with the glyphosate. And the bees don't have a chance. There's a direct toxicity to the glyphosate. And you look at these levels. German legislature last year passed a bill, said you don't have to identify the sex of your child at birth. Gives them six months. You say, well, it's a dumb law. Can't you look at the plumbing and tell which uh, uh, gender it, 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 the child is? And the truth is that in many situations, you can't. You look at a half a part per million. Up here is antiandrogenic. That's the male hormone development. Two parts per million is the estrogenic. That our children are being compromised in the womb. We don't have that opportunity often to do it until they can do the genetic analysis for the X and Y chromosome before they start the surgery. And so it's becoming common enough that uh, they felt impressed even past the bill. But you see the direct toxicity and then you see the levels that the EPA says are safe. These levels aren't based on science. These are based on the companies coming to them and saying, in order to have safe food, we have to raise the tolerance levels because <clears throat> that's what we're finding in the food. And all you have to do is say, well, why does soybean oil up here, refined soybean oil, how come it's only half as toxic in glyphosate as it is for canola uh, oil up here. Canola, the level's 20 parts per, per million. <coughs> With uh, refined soybean oil, it's 40. And you look at the others, and the, the answer to that is it has nothing to do with science. It's what we're finding in the product. And so they have to set the level and keep raising the level because we're finding more and more residue in the products. You get up here to, to even 400 for alfalfa hay, and then you say, when the farmer called you, or the veterinarian called me two weeks ago and said, I have a client that has 113 800 pound calves, and he lost 26 of them yesterday from chronic botulism. Said, can you help, help me explain why? And I said, yeah, what was he feeding him? Said, well, he, he sprayed his lentils and his flax with glyphosate as a desiccant, used the straw then as a bedding for the cattle, and turns out there were 4,000 parts per million glyphosate in his lentil straw. That's not only absorbed through the skin, but it's all the cattle will nibble on it. When you have that much glyphosate, you also inhibit the sucrosynthetase enzyme in that straw, that late stage, and it leaves a high concentration of reducing sugars so that for the cattle it tastes like you'd put molasses on it. And they'll consume a lot more. They get enough then that you start losing those cattle from chronic botulism. It takes five or six weeks for it to develop, but look at the levels that we're told. 80% <coughs> of our food contains GMO ingredients. Look how many of them have soybean components, oil or lecithin, any of those other components. And so we have very high rate of contamination the uh, Tony Mitra has just published a book, e-book on uh, Amazon, took the 8,000 food samples from the Canadian Food Inspection Authority and has categorized them and worked them down. Title of the book is Poisonous Foods of North America. <laughs> and you'll find that Canada 
as a source has the highest levels of glyphosate of anywhere in the world. The U.S. is a close second. Most other countries are very low by comparison. All of them well above those toxic levels that we know from our clinical and our research studies to cause serious health problems. Look at the study of moms across America that's been followed up with, and you see the level of glyphosate that's in, in the breast milk. And with its antibiotic activity, a child isn't born with that gut microbiome. It develops that through the breast milk and through the feeding. That's why the American Association of Pediatrics recommends that you continue breastfeeding for at least six months after you start feeding a solid food because solid food will have clostridium spores. They're ubiquitous in the environment. If uh, the only way that you can counter that and get that probiotic established is provide that source externally to the baby. And the breast, breast milk is an excellent source for those organisms. But you're not going to have an opportunity for those, that probiotic to be there with that level of uh, glyphosate in the material or in the... Uh, breast milk. We can see the same thing with cancer and we can go through all of those things. This is Monsanto's own study in 1981 that was just released through the lawsuit in uh, California. They had 50 animals, 50 rats in this study, but 55.8 percent developed a lymphoma on that. Zero in the controls. This has been, been hidden all the time, and we can go through all the other uh, data. You can just go through hundreds of pages of data on the toxicity and the health effects, but you wonder why now uh, cancer used to peak at 70 and 75 for breast cancer, why it's now peaking at 25 to 40. And you see what, what's happening with these chronic toxins. And the studies are there. They've been censored. They've been uh, hidden. Uh, this is data that EPA had. And then you see Marion Conley's uh, deathbed letter to her supervisor that was just released, where she identifies the 17 mechanisms that will cause cancer that we know cause cancer, and she says glyphosate stimulates every one of them. It has to be declared as a carcinogen. She says, I've written my letter now. I hope it's public. I can go to my grave now with a clear conscience. So. So he got cheated uh, in that uh, he misunderstood <laughs> that we were trying to have 20 minutes for each talk. Let's see. Robert Schimmick, who's, you're up next, sir. Yeah, I will. Well, again, thank you all for being here and sticking around. I know there's <clears throat> there's lots of great and wonderful, well, I won't say great and wonderful. You know, it's not being said about pesticides here this morning. Yeah, it's kind of, I haven't been to one of these in a while. And 
I kind of better understand now why, because the last time I went to one, I, was, I came away afraid. And it's like, well, who, who wants to live with fear? But that's the reality. That's the reality of the world we live in. Um, so I also need to say that, you know, when looking at this agenda and who's who, especially on this panel in particular, I've seen this amazing list of people, these names with PhD, 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 and then there's me. <laughs> when, um, when I was talking with Carla, one of the organizers here for this event, she was trying to persuade me into coming, and it took a little bit. It wasn't an automatic yes. <clears throat> but for a little bit, you know, when, I was, when this thing was, was developing, I thought, well, I need some initials on behind my name, okay? And I thought, well, what could that be? And when I came up with it, I think I'm actually going to get some cards printed that say this. Robert Chimek, R-R-I. Okay? Regular Reservation Indian. Okay. That's me. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, got to have something behind your name, right? I, I don't know. Anyway, with that all said, I want to talk a little bit about a different types of toxicity. I want to talk about cultural toxicity or toxicity related to the culture of indigenous people and specifically the Anishinaabek of Gawa Babakanika, Gishkonigan, the White Earth Indian Reservation. <clears throat> um, and it's something I feel, well, you know, like I said earlier, you know, when you talk, when uh, Hubert Humphrey talked about you know, the success of democracy and, or failure of democracy and its measurements being the, you know, the very young, the very old, and those on the margins. You know, we've been kind of on the margins of things up there for a long, long time, okay? And, <clears throat> you know, when trying to engage this battle, not only with all what you're all saying and talking and talking about here last night and today, but I feel I felt it was important to look at well, what's going on? How does this affect Anishinaabe? And that loosely translates to Indian people, but I want to say that. You know, there's, we, we have to differentiate a couple of things here. One, you know, when you look at the map, it says White Earth Indian Reservation. You look at the official title of who we are, it says White Earth Band of Chippewa Indians. That's political, okay? That's governance, that's regulatory. <clears throat> Anishinaabe is based in a set of values, ethics, mores, principles that goes back millennia, okay? Anishinaabe and all that it encompasses in terms of how we live on this earth is the very thing that kept us alive, kept us healthy, kept us prospering and even kept us strong through the incredible forces of acculturation and assimilation and colonization. So, <clears throat> you know, you can put a lot of different lenses on those words, but I feel like uh, what's happening 
in the world today is just one more step in that whole colonization process. So let me explain a little bit about that. Um, cultural impacts. For me, what it means as a native person, an indigenous person, as one who tries to live by those Anishinaabe ethics and standards, <clears throat> this is really all about this intersection where the paths meet between pesticides, climate change, loss of habitat, and those impacts upon those of us who try to live this way. No, when we were put here, and we have our own creation story, um, we were put here, and, but prior to us being put here, this world, this earth, this North America, this Turtle Island was prepared for us. Turtle Island, <clears throat> I just want to make a quick note there. Um, the continent is, cha is shaped like a turtle. You can see it best on a globe. Flat maps don't work so well, but next time you get up to a globe, look at North America. The head of this turtle, which is a, an important part of our creation story, hugely important, is those set of islands up there in Canada, Baffin Island and that whole group up there. <clears throat> then you have the shell of the turtle, which is the main embodiment of which is the US and Canada. One of the arms is the Alaska Peninsula, one of the front arms. The other front arm is the Gaspé Peninsula of Canada. One of the back legs is the Florida Peninsula. The other back leg is the Baja Peninsula of California and Mexico. And the tail extends all the way down to Panama. Okay, That's Turtle Island. You can see it plain as day on a map. So when we talk about this thing, when we talk about our creation story and we talk about how we got here and why we were put here and our obligations as Anishinaabe, you know, it extends to those agreements, that back and forth, that exchange for life, what we call Bemadaziwin, the good life, Mino Bemadaziwin. And <clears throat> There's a back and forth there that has to do with gifting and reciprocity. You know, the things we have to do to take care of these things, how we acknowledge and honor and respect these things, and <clears throat> the life we receive back for that. Pesticides, I talked about that earlier. Impacts of pesticides on the land and the things that, you know, the, the, the rates, the ubiquitous, ubiquitous presence of pesticides on our reservation. There's been a lot of talk here thus far about, you know, pesticides and pollinators, pollinators specifically. Another piece of this has to do with climate change. Okay, those of you who are from Minnesota know what type of a almost winter we had this year. You know, it was the same up where I'm from. The first half of the winter, actually, it started out pretty good. You know, we had plenty of snow. We had some cold. We even hit 40 below one night out there at Mud Lake, where I live. And... Uh, I thought, well, that's a good thing, because that's how it's supposed to be. But that was only one night. 
when I was growing up up there, you know, you could always count on at least two weeks of 40 below weather during the winter. Maybe it wasn't all at once, but you had a couple of weeks. It was going to be 40 below at nights. That rarely happens anymore. The concern I have, and this is where, you know, we get this intersection with culture. Okay, pollinators are already struggling. It's been clearly demonstrated and said over and over here so far this weekend. You know, we have a crisis. We have a problem in terms of the food supply. All right. I want to take it a step further <clears throat> and just say that because of pesticides and the impact on the environment, on ecological health, okay, with diminished, encumbered, no longer healthy pollinators, and you couple that with the intersection of climate change, my concern is simply this. Because of the combined effects of pesticides, combined effects of climate change, we're at a point now where my biggest concern is not only will the pollinators even be available, but, but the timing, you know, when those plants, those wild foods, those berries, those medicines that we gather from the land, that which was put here for us, <clears throat> that with climate change, the timing is going to be off. And I think we're already starting to see that a little bit in the blueberries. The last two years, we don't have much blueberries on the reservation, but just off the reservation, not too far, you know, there are some places where historically there's been a lot of blueberries. I mean, the kind of blueberry patches where you walk out there and the ground is blue. Last two years, hardly anything. So I don't, you know, I can't say beyond a shadow of a doubt because I don't have that PhD thing. But just, you know, based on my observation, based on my participation as on Anishinaabeg, I'm supposed to be out there gathering those berries. I'm supposed to be out there gathering those medicine plants. We're starting to see a problem, okay? So, I don't know, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know how to stop it. I mean, we've had, a lot, we've had a lot of good discussion. But, you know, going back to what Humphrey said, you know, about the success of our democracy, those on the margins of life. You know, we've been there for a lot, a lot of years, ever since the colonization of our landscape. And it's just been kind of a downhill curve since. So, you know, we can have our ceremonies, we can revitalize our language, you know, we can do a lot of things to, for, you know, in terms of cultural revitalization, but I feel like, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the way I, I've, I've kind of characterized this, I'm almost beginning to feel like, uh, you know, with these three things, these pesticides, this climate change, this loss of habitat, I almost feel like uh, pretty soon we're at a point where you know, metaphorically, I would have to say, if he was to load up every man, woman, and child who is on a shinabe, and <clears throat> on a great big old airplane, fly them over to the Sahara Desert in Africa, drop them off, who would we become? Okay? That's my concern. When these environmental 
ecological impacts of the industrialization of our landscape start intersecting in a variety of ways, you know, I almost feel like that's where we're headed. Because we are an earth-based culture, we are an earth-based people, our language is based, it's, it, 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 it's, it's an earth-based language. And my concern is soon, you know, we keep going down this road, you know, we're going to have a facsimile of Anishinaabeg, okay? The habitat, conversion of habitat. Some of you may know about the fight we're having with RDO, you know, in terms of their acquisition of a bunch of uh, land they got from the Potlatch Corporation, a large multinational timber corporation that they're try attempting to convert for potato production. And that's off the reservation. But I want to say they've already been on the reservation. Potlatch Corporation, other timber interests on the reservation for a long, long time. One of, uh, one of the elders I used to know, he's passed away now. He was a harvester, he was a gatherer, he picked medicines. And <clears throat> he, he told me one day, he says, there's a certain kind that I go out at a certain time of year to get. And I have three different places I go because we're taught we never take everything from, an, from, from one place. We always leave some for the birds, the wildlife, the pollinators, whatever. And he went to one patch in the forest and he said, I couldn't even recognize where I was because the forest was gone. He went to the next place, same thing. Within that year, both places where he'd previously gone on his rotation were decimated. So finally he said, I had to go back to the third place, which is the one I harvested last year. So, I, you know, he said, I feel bad because I'm taking more than I should. So... <clears throat> Those are just a couple of thoughts I wanted to share. When we talk about toxicity and how it all comes together and the impacts on human and environmental health, I just wanted to register my observations as a regular reservation Indian. <laughs> Thank you. We're trying to get the right, right one up now. That's not it. Ah. There it is. Okay, David, you're up. Is this the right one? I can't tell. Oh, you can't tell yet. How about now? <laughs> that looks right. Great. I recognize Thanks. that. Great. Well, uh, thank you. I'm not sure I have the brain power to do this twice in one day, so this will be a little shorter than the last <laughs> one. Um, but what I want to talk to you now about is a book that's coming out literally next week, but that looks at the way agriculture may be able to change and maintain its productivity and it involves applying some of the principles that we talked about earlier uh, in the hidden half of nature and it's a direct outgrowth of that but it's um, motivated by a simple question which planet would you rather live on the one with soil or the one without 
We could also mention an atmosphere and water, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> um, but when you look at Earth, it's the only planet that we know of that actually has soil. And if you think back to what I was talking about earlier about the marriage of geology and biology, Earth's also the only planet that we know of that has biology. And if you look at the history of life on the continents, the interrelationship of the development of healthy fertile soils and the, healthy, and the development and, and elaboration of life outside the seas are intimately uh, interconnected. But if you look at the state of the world's soils today, um, and you look at the, the UN's global map of soil degradation, we've really started to degrade what I like to call uh, as the, the skin of the earth across the world as a whole. There's very few areas on that map that are not uh, indicated to have some degree of degraded soil. And there's an awful lot of red areas with very degraded soil. This is a global problem in terms of degradation of the resource, the soil, that we really have always relied on for our living, whether it was from the indirect harvesting of things that were the, the fruits of nature or the direct uh, products of agriculture, something like 97% of our sustenance globally comes from the soil. Um, how significant a problem is soil degradation globally? Well, um, back in the 1990s, uh, David Pimental and his colleagues at Cornell wrote that over in the time since the Second World War, soil erosion and soil degradation caused farmers to abandon some 430 million hectares of arable land. And that's an area that's equivalent to about a third of all present cropland, the size of China and India combined. Now, when we look at the problem of feeding the world by 2050, 2100, or thereafter, however you want to look at the, the forecast for the evolution of human demographics and population, it really would be very useful to have that one third of our cropland that we've degraded within the last century. And in fact, if we had that and we made it as productive as the average cropland on, in the world, we wouldn't be talking about how to feed the world of tomorrow. We'd already know how we were going to do it. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, if we look back uh, at our um, the early history of the United States on the eastern seaboard, um, and we look at the magnitude of historical soil erosion that shaped some of the, the early days of the US. Um, this shows you a map from down here in Alabama up, up to Virginia, and it shows the integrated effects of uh, the first couple hundred years of colonial farming. And it shows the magnitude of historical soil erosion in this, in this noodle of land that is in the Piedmont region the upland area, so we're not looking at the coastal plain, not looking at the Appalachians, we're looking at the, the upland hill country. And if you want to know why we're looking at just that area, well, read the dirt book. It explains it in a couple hundred pages very well. Um, but what I want to point out here is that there's a loss of four to 10 inches of soil over the whole region, and in some places, more than 10 inches. Now, how big a deal is that? There was only about a foot or less of really thick black highly fertile topsoil across this whole region when European colonists first landed in North America. So in less than 200 years, we've managed to shave off a third to almost all of the topsoil across the original, one of the original agricultural areas of production in this country. And that's really quite a feat, actually. And it helps explain how the Romans could have done the same thing to central Italy over the course of five centuries, um, how the Greeks did it uh, several times, actually, through the, the Neolithic of the Bronze Age and then the Classical Age of, of Greece, and now they're doing it again today. Um, the problem of regional soil degradation is not illusory. It is very real and is very serious, and it, the problem at a global scale is a really huge one. Um, I went to a farm um, in, well, actually it was a tobacco plantation in North Carolina a couple years ago when we were filming a, a Nova episode that was looking at, um, I, I got a call from the producers that basically said, we're doing the geological history of North America and we're almost done shooting and we, we, we forgot that we didn't have anything on soil. So what could we do in five minutes that would tell the history of soil in North America? And I was like, really? <laughs> five minutes? Um, and what we decided to do is to go to a tobacco plantation in the eastern seaboard right in North Carolina in that upper Piedmont zone of the hill country that I just showed you the map of. And notice that, well, I, I guess I should make, ask you to guess. There's soil on the right, soil on the left. Which one is from the tobacco plantation and which one is from the forest next door? This is what the soil, the, the, the soil is identical in terms of what it looks like on a geological map. The rocks are the same. Everything's the same except the land use history, what people have done to the land. 
And the soil on the right is what, um, you know, a century or two of uh, intensive tobacco cultivation will do to the land. And there's not much dark brown, there's not much black in it. In fact, there's not, not much topsoil on the, on the slope. You go and dig a hole in the forest right next door and you see a lot of organic matter, the soil's a whole different color, it's very productive. Um, this is essentially what I thought of it for the five minute segment that you could try and show people what's happened to the soils of North America. If you average across North American cropland, uh, we've lost about 50% of the organic matter that was in soils when, they were, when um, Europeans arrived on the continent. Um, in some areas like the eastern Palouse uh, part of Washington state, we've actually lost half the topsoil. In other farms I went to in North Carolina, the entire topsoil is gone and the farmers are now farming the subsoil. And the only way to do that is with agrochemical intensive agriculture because the natural reservoir of fertility has been removed. Well, you saw what I talked about earlier in terms of what, what Ann had done to uh, our yard in Seattle in terms of bringing our, our soil back to life and taking stuff that looked like this and turning it into stuff like that uh, in our own yard. So the question that I really wanted to wrestle with in trying to research uh, this, this brand new book is, is soil restoration possible? Can we do it at scale? Can we reverse the historical pattern of soil degradation that's taken out a third of our cropland globally in the last century? And can we do it in the developing world, the developed world? Can we do it in small farms, large farms? I spent about six months traveling around the world interviewing farmers who had restored their soil, who had brought their farms back to life from a degraded condition. Um, and the principles to, to sort of advertise the answer before I get into showing you a couple of the examples briefly, um, is it seemed like there really were three general principles that translated universally into improving soil health in ways that allowed maintaining agricultural production and not coincidentally, improving farm profitability that translate around the world. There, those principles are, are minimal or no disturbance, the direct planting of seeds or no-till agriculture. And one of the ironic things about the spread of no-till agriculture in the last several decades is it was greatly facilitated by the development of GMO, um, GMO crops and the use of glyphosate. Uh, and I'm not advocating either. In fact, if you read the book, you'll see basically what I'm trying to offer is a way to not use either um, in agriculture and maintain production. Um, but why did farmers plow? If you read the dirt book, the big villain of that book is plow-based agriculture. Because when you take a plow and you turn the surface of the earth over, you're basically leaving the ground void of plants until the next plants come back. And in that window, if you think like a geologist, a big storm, a single big storm, can cause enough erosion to take away a century's worth of soil production under natural, a natural pace. Because nature makes soils at a pace of a tenth of a millimeter a year we can do it much faster if we put our minds to it and change our agricultural practices. So the first step is minimal or no disturbance of the soil. Uh, if you think about what happens to all those mycorrhizae in the soil when you plow, it's just like if a, a Godzilla came into here and stomped on this room, it would disturb us. It is not something that promotes um, soil ecology. Ecology. Maintaining a permanent ground cover and retaining crop residues and cover crops uh, being included in rotations uh, is sort of an essential component, keeping the land surface. It's not enough just to not till. If you, if you don't till and you strip all the crop residue off, you'll still have erosion. Um, and integrating diverse crop rotations to maintain soil fertility and break up pathogen carryover. Those are the three common elements that the farmers that I visited who had been successful at really rebuilding their soil fertility practiced all three. Some also added innovative methods of livestock um, uh, husbandry back onto their farms and reintegrated animal husbandry and crop production. And there's a very interesting story in terms of how those became divorced in the 1940s as farmers were encouraged to specialize in one or the other. And we broke the link that actually um, helped through which livestock consumed crop stubble and turned it into readily available plant uptakeable compounds um, that help maintain fertility. So where did I go and what did I really look at uh, where I could draw those general principles? And I should advertise that while I'm advertising those three pr principles, minimal disturbance of the soil, integrating cover crops, uh, and diversifying rotations as universal and translatable at every farm I went to in low technology, high technology, developing, developed world, those principles really seemed to work to revive soil health. Um, but the practices were different everywhere I went. Why? Well, you know how many different kinds of soil there are in the world? Several hundred thousand. 
you know, how many different kinds of levels of technology there are in farms in the world. You know, it ranges from, you know, um, uh, hand labor to incredible uh, un, you know, modern technology that I could barely even wrap my mind around on in terms of um, same way that when I open up the hood of my car these days, I can't fix anything. I used to fix my VW. I could, but anyway, I went to visit people like Dwayne Beck in uh, South Dakota, who's running um, the Dakota Lakes Research Farm, um, and this shows you his example. There's not much in the way of bare earth in his fields. They started off looking at um, uh, going to no-till agriculture in an area that I actually featured a, the, a photograph from the area around his farm on the cover of, of dirt. It's a abandoned farm machinery during the Dust Bowl era. He took me on a tour of some 300 miles uh, of farmland around where he's working now, and I saw three tilled fields. I saw almost no black earth. They have completely revolutionized how they are farming. And after going to no-till agriculture, they started to think of, oh, well, what if we added um, cro um, cover crops? What if we started to diversify the rotations? He's barely using any agrochemicals on his fields now. And it's the farmers that have followed his lead on it are actually much more profitable because they've managed to maintain their crop yields, maintain their harvest, but they've greatly reduced their agrochemical expenses. And if you look at uh, what uh, is structuring a lot of farm economics today in this country, farmers are kind of caught in a squeeze play between the overproduction of commodity crops, which drives the prices down, and price rises in terms of the inputs, fertilizer and agrochemicals that conventional agriculture uses. Um, and the companies either buying or selling on either end of that do fairly well. It's the farmers that are caught in the middle. And I think there's a real opportunity if we can show people ways to maintain their productivity while reducing their input costs. They may not go organic, but they could get more organic-ish, like all the people that I'm showing you here. I went to Ghana and visited uh, Kofi Boa, who runs the Center for No-Till Agriculture in Kumasi, Ghana, where they do a lot of um, um, multi-cropping, polycropping. Um, and there were some farmers who had up to eight different crops growing in the same field at one time. Um, and he is basically working with a population of subsistence farmers who do not use much in the way of, of agrochemical inputs because they cannot afford to buy agrochemical inputs. They can't afford to buy GMO seeds. Um, but these same principles of minimal disturbance, integrating cover crops, and diversifying their rotations have more than doubled their crop yields and actually helped transform the village where he is from and he went back to work and established his center. He's basically transformed it from an area where hardly anyone owned their own home to where almost everyone owns their own home and done it in less than a decade. This is sort of a step on the road to sustainable development. Um, I also visited farmers like Gabe Brown, that those of you who are familiar with the soil health movement have probably run into Gabe and, and Dave Brandt. Uh, Gabe is a, a North Dakota uh, farmer and rancher who's done very innovative uh, things in terms of bringing intensive livestock grazing back onto his farm what he has done to his soil relative to what his neighbor's soils look like. And again, it's geologically, it's the same soil. The difference is in what he's done to it or what his cows have helped do to it. Um, the difference is like night and day. Um, it's amazing. They've uh, actually taken places that have, gone, have ha historically had just several percent organic matter or less and brought them back up to about the organic matter content of the native prairie soil, somewhere between 6 and 10%. Um, and done it in just a couple decades. It's transformative. Um, David Brandt is a, a major uh, fan of radishes in his crop rotations and cover crops, and he plants his radishes not to sell. Uh, he was actually quite surprised when I told him that, you know, you could probably sell that for five bucks in the farmer's market in Seattle. <laughs> um, and he was like, I'm not doing that. That's feeding my microbes. Um, he grows radishes and cover crops in between his commercial crops. He's a commodity crop producer, mostly doing corn and, and soy, but he grows cover crops like these, daikon, like these radishes in between his crops to basically uh, fertilize his soil and to feed the soil microbiota that helps him nourish his crops. He hasn't been using, he hasn't used any herbicide, and I think he's used about three or four years beyond using that now. He hardly uses any nitrogen fertilizer, and he sort of ran the numbers in terms of what he's producing. He's out producing the county average in terms of yields, but he's dropped his agriculture, his agrochemical input expenses by between 50 to 90 percent, depending on whether you're talking about diesel uh, herbicides or pesticides. In other words, he's basically, these folks have, have essentially weaned themselves off of the conventional agrochemical inputs that 
cause so many problems um, in the world today. And I also visited um, Rattan Lal at The Ohio State University who uh, has been running a long-term no-till uh, field trial. This just shows you some of the cores that you can go out and, and drill in their field trials and see the difference between, um, you know, if you just go to no-till, you ended up, he basically, after 20 years, you t turned stuff from really light brown into this sort of, you know, sort of uh, brownish. But if you added cover crops and you added organic manure, uh, you essentially could turn it back to black earth. Um, this is like a radical, this is essentially what Ann did to our yard, but doing it, we can do it at scale and do it with full on intensive agriculture that does not sacrifice yields and yet rebuilds soil health. What are the kinds of benefits that um, really uh, result from what could be broadly termed conservation agriculture? Um, yields basically were maintained. There's um, all the farms that I looked at had about a two to three year transition period when they, once, once they adopted the full suite of all three practices, and it's important I think to adopt all three to get a rapid transition to building better soil health. It's not just enough to go no-till or just in, in, introduce cover crops or just diversify irritation. Each one of those things can produce net benefits in, on its own in the short run. But from what I can see, the real power is thinking of this as a new system that involves all three elements because they work together to foster the beneficial microbial life that ramps up the whole engine of fertility and productivity in the soil. So a couple year transition to actually get yields back up. Why might that be? Well, imagine if what the soil life is within a soil where you've been conventionally farming it since the Second World War. And imagine if your organic matter content is down less than about 2%. You don't have a lot to feed those beneficial microbes, and uh, it can take some time to rebuild the organic matter that could actually start to rebuild um, the biology. They all greatly reduce their fossil fuel and pesticide use. Um, not all of them, not all the farmers that I visited were completely off of pesticides. Uh, I also visited um, Jeff Moyer at the, the Rodale Institute where they are organic. All these principles can be done organically. But the key point I wanted to make in the book is that if conventional farmers started adopting these practices, their need for the things that they, we think of as conventional agriculture would be so greatly reduced that they could become organic-ish. And some, like Gabe Brown, is organic in, in, he's essentially an organic farmer, but he doesn't really want to get certified because um, he thinks what he does is better. <laughs> and he's probably right, depending on what farm you're comparing it to. Um, all these farms increase their soil carbon uh, content, which uh, plays into helping to build plant health and crop resistance to disease. And once you build up your, your, your soil carbon and you build up the beneficial microbial communities and your plants get healthier, you don't need to use as much in the way of herbicides and pesticides because your plants are doing that much more on their own. Uh, they were more profitable because their expenses went down while their uh, income stayed about the same. And the part that I could find the least hard data on, but that I'm actually trying to start working on a new book about now, is what happens to the nutrient density, the quality of the food that's grown. So I think that we need to look in terms of soil health as the future of agriculture. Uh, that's the lens that we really ought to be looking at evaluating agricultural practices through because we could truly transform modern agriculture if we prioritize the practices that built soil health. And again, I've written a bit about this. So thank you very much. Uh, I encourage you to do, do some reading, um, but I'm not so crass as to assign homework. Thank you. <laughs>